with that, let me just run the simulation and um, walk through the demo. Now, one thing about this simulation is um, this is the size it comes in and I can't make it any larger. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change my Zoom sharing setting. I, I believe if I share it so that I'm just sharing that application window, it'll at least to make the shared screen appear larger to you. So I hope that's the case and I'm relying on my real-time audience to tell me if uh, that's not the case. Somehow the somehow either I'm not sharing my oscilloscope screen or if my shared screen doesn't fill, fill up your own screen, then let me know so that uh, I'll know to fix it. So with that, so this is oscilloscope. I hope uh, it kind of looks familiar even from having watched the video demonstration last time. And uh, yeah, so let me do the uh, same thing that, let me try to do the same thing that I was doing in the, um, with the real oscilloscope last time, which is, you know, putting in a one kilohertz signal into one of these inputs and have it display it stably on the screen and go from there. So, so, um, so, <laughs> so I've tested, drove this uh, for about an hour or so. So I know the typical mistakes that I was making. For the moment, I'm gonna pretend that I haven't done that, so I'll, remake the same mistakes. This is a part of the thing that's uh, sometimes difficult about using oscilloscope, that it is a complex device and there are settings that can be set up in the wrong way. And um, and you have to discover <laughs> that the setting was set up in the wrong way and fix it. So, okay, so my goal right now is to display a one kilohertz signal on this screen. So I need to turn the oscilloscope on. Oh, and with the simulation, the one of the first things uh, that's sometimes frustrating is the controls. So, you know, turning it on seems simple enough. I'm left clicking on the power button and it turned on, great. And um, I have these function generators on the bottom. Uh, let me left click on the power button of one of the function generators. And somehow I need to click twice, but it turned on, okay. Now, I guess I'm trying to display a signal. So let me try doing click and drag from this output here into this channel one input, okay. That seems to work fine, good. And this is where um, you'll start getting stuck, which is okay, it's not showing anything here. So what do I do? Uh, is it the trigger? And when I left to click on this, it's not doing anything, it's not even moving and um, maybe as you're trying a bunch of different things, you maybe right click and then say, oh, okay, right clicking it moves it. So now it's on auto, but it's still not showing. So, okay. So I know from my experience using oscilloscope that on auto mode, it should work. It should at least display something. And right now it's not okay. So then I look at, Oh, um, well, bolts per division is a maximum. That's probably good. Oh, this is a pause knob, uh, which is, I would guess it's the vertical position of the signal. It's turned all the way counterclockwise. It probably should be somewhere in the middle. So let me try clicking and dragging it. It doesn't do anything. Um, let me left click, does nothing. If I right click, I think you might see it very imperceptibly move. <laughs> um, now, if you read the instruction on the web page, it says in addition to left and right click, uh, the mouse scroll also controls it. So um, in tech world, there's this acronym, RTMF, which stands for read the fine manual and um, Oscilloscope is one of those devices where you have to read the manual. Uh, even simulation, you should read the manual of the simulation. So let me use the mouse scroll bar that will help me move this post nut more quickly. <laughs> I don't need a thousand right clicks to get it to this position, but, um, but it's still not working. So I'm going to um, cut out about five minutes of me um, <laughs> struggling with this, which comes down to, it comes down to this horizontal knob. 
it's on XY mode and on XY mode, it can do weird things. And um, so I guess on a real oscilloscope, if it were on XY mode, I think it, it would have put a dot somewhere here, but um, this is simulation, so, but anyways, it's not supposed to be on XY mode. It, uh, the uh, good default of mode for it to be is something like one millisecond per division. So let me change this knob so that it goes to, ah, there's the signal now, one millisecond per division. So once you have a trace showing, that's, uh, uh, that's really the hardest part because once you have a trace showing, then it's uh, much easier to get feedback on if what you are doing is working or not. So right now I see just a flat line. So uh, let me position pause more precisely. Yeah, I'm assuming that's ground. Um, so, okay, I have something that's a flat. So um, that's probably because my signal isn't big enough on my function generator. I have this amplitude knob, yeah, which is turned all the way counterclockwise. So using scroll bar, let me turn it up to some reasonable, respectable quantity. Okay, I'm not seeing any change there. So let's look at the oscilloscope setting. Uh, it's on ground, so this is just on ground. Let's uh, turn it to DC. Okay, now we are getting some here. <laughs> we are at least seeing a signal which um, isn't stable, but it's a, it's a starting place. And um, so, well, let's uh, see if uh, um, it's a trigger thing. Uh, usually if you see a signal, but it's not stable, then it's usually a trigger thing. So I put it on auto so that it'll, it's guaranteed to trigger, even when it's not triggering correctly. Let me put it on norm. Okay, then now I can mess with the level to try to get it to trigger correctly. Okay, there it is. Yeah, so it's a triggering at a particular level. Let me, just, let me just put it in the middle. So it's triggering at around the zero volt. And oh, oh, yeah, it's a, such a gradual thing because it's a sine wave at something like a 10 hertz. Let me change this knob. I'm right clicking to turn it clockwise. Okay, now I'm at, it's probably at one kilohertz. Um, yeah, yeah, when it's at one kilohertz, what I, what I should see is, I'm on one millisecond per division. So um, I have a period of about one division. So one millisecond is my period. That's uh, one kilohertz. Okay, I, I think we are in business. Um, yeah, so that's <laughs> like the first step <laughs> in using oscilloscope. And, um, and you know, it, the first few times you do it, it can be frustrating, which is why, um, um, in the introduction, which is why we have a whole lab that's just the introduction to oscilloscope and like a whole part of it is getting this signal to display. So, uh, so once you have that, then you can do a bunch of different things. Um, I guess, uh, what do I want to do first? There were some things about AC mode that I wanted to uh, demonstrate, but when I tested it out with a square wave earlier, um, it didn't really do the thing that I wanted it to do. In fact, it just kept crashing the thing. So I, I don't think I'm gonna do that. Um, I'll just to show you um, that dangers of using AC mode with a real oscilloscope, maybe next week or the week after. So I'll set up a time to do that. Um, for now, I'll just, uh, I, I think there's one place where I can show you the difference between DC and AC mode. Um, but for now, I'll just leave it on DC for now and get to the AC mode later. Um, let's see, something I can do just on this screen. I think on this screen, um, I mean, I invite you to play with it <laughs> for your own purposes. You know, see what this far, far not does. This is the variable scale control. It uncalibrates uh, it from the scale here. And, but you know, it also lets you set more precise things. Um, I think for this kind of introduction, I'll leave it here. This uh, simulation has a couple experiments built in. I think they are fairly useful and uh, I might be using uh, probably these two in the written instructions for your upcoming lab. 
So let me show you some of these, how, how, how uh, an experiment using real oscilloscope might work. Uh, that's you know, the benefit of this simulation over the FET simulation because it shows um, what a, it gives you a better sense of what a real experiment would look like. So let me do the, this diode thing. I think this is one mode where I can demonstrate some, um, some aspect of the difference between AC and DC mode. It's not the complete aspect, but it's a starting point. Okay, I'm gonna just skip through the first few things about turning it on and putting the signal in. Let me so so let me, so let me get to the place where I was before. So I'm just gonna not talk too much and just to finish setting this up. Um, this was on norm level. Trying to remember all the settings. Um, that that's uh, one of the things that. Um, that makes you know using oscilloscope potentially challenging, which is that um, it's a thing you have to. Uh, <laughs> why isn't it displaying anything? What did I miss? Um, um, Let's see. Oh, it probably was, yeah, it wasn't triggering because it was on ground. There was no signal to trigger. Okay, so I'm back to where I was. <laughs> so uh, let me change the scale a little bit so that I'm seeing more of the sinusoidal looking thing. Um, so this is an experiment to demonstrate diode, which we didn't really talk about. I kind of skip out on nonlinear circuit elements. Um, so diode does kind of what this diagram almost suggests. It lets current flow in one direction and not the other direction. So, oh, so le let me hook it up this way. I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, get a second output and put it in here as an input to this entire circuit. So what this, function, what this is doing now is function generator is imposing a voltage that goes from, okay, two volts per divisions and it's uh, two and a half. So it, this uh, signal is um, a five volt peak signal or 10 volt peak to peak. It goes from minus five volts to five volts. And the function, you have to imagine I'm using some kind of T that to split the signal into two that's parallel. Uh, this is putting that signal into this circuit. It's uh, applying a time dependent uh, sinusoidal voltage going from minus five to five volts across this circuit element. And if you read the fine manual for this simulation, it'll tell you that the function generators are floating power supplies, meaning the ground, the, the outer connection here, it's not connect you to anything else. It's just, uh, it's floating. So this outer connection here, it's connected to this portion of the circuit. So uh, looking at this circuit diagram carefully, following the gray lines, this outside gray line is connected. So it's connected to here and it's connected to the inner conductor of uh, this um, connection adapter. And I guess that's uh, all the places it's connected to. So the channel two, I can use it to display uh, one of the two signals. I can either use it to display the voltage difference across the diode. So if I do that, this is, uh, I need to set this up similar. I'm kind of looking at the channel one setting and I'm just copying over that setting so that um, it looks similar. Oh, and this needs to be in dual mode. Uh, let me make sure it's grounded correctly before I flip the switch to DC. Um, oh, and okay, so this is what the voltage change across the diode looks like. The, um, and I'm looking at the diagram carefully to see, okay, so the outside of this connection is connect, connected here. So, for the purpose of what the oscilloscope is displaying, this is ground, this point is ground, and it's showing me the voltage on the inside. 
uh, uh, yeah, which is the same as the voltage uh, from the function generator. Yeah, and that's what I see here. It's uh, so when the voltage from the function generator goes negative, that's exactly the voltage. Um, the voltage difference across the diode is exactly the voltage from the function generator. And when the function, so there's a slight bit that goes a little bit positive, um, but it doesn't go much more positive than that. It, um, it, so as the function gen generator is applying more positive voltage, the voltage across the, the diode is capped as some value. That's what it's showing. So, so that's one. And I can also do this. Oops. Uh, uh, Okay, I think I have to just disconnect the whole thing. I can, instead of connecting the voltage drop across the diode, I can show the voltage drop across the register this way. And this one takes a little bit of thinking through to see what it means. Um, the biggest thing is this, the, um, so I think that's uh, why the, the person who programmed this uh, arranged it this way in order to make sure that the um, that he doesn't create accidental shorts uh, where the some connections are grounded through the oscilloscope. He made sure that these two connectors, both of their grounds, are connected here. So 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 when you look at what's on the inner, what's uh, the signal that's being plotted here. That's uh, actually the signal here. So in some sense, um, especially with respect to the direction of the current, he reversed the polarities for the connection for the register, which I, I guess makes sense. I, it's a, I think reasonable, it was a reasonable thing to do, but uh, because he did that, what I do have to do is for this a signal to match up with what I was saying earlier, uh, I have to invert channel to signal. So this is where invert button comes in handy because I can invert it to, um, so what this is showing is okay, when the function generator applies negative voltage, then no current flows through the diode. That is why the voltage drop across the register is zero. That makes perfect sense, at least to me. And when the function generator starts applying positive voltage, that's when the current, uh, I guess after a little bit of a voltage drop across the diode that you saw earlier, after a little bit of that, it passes uh, most of the current, or not most, <laughs> it, um, diode has zero, effective zero resistance and it passes current through as if this would be a just regular wire. So that's what this is showing. It's showing the voltage drop across the register as the function generator applies a positive voltage where current flows through the diode. So, so, so that's um, what this is showing. And I think this is uh, uh, one where I can demonstrate one aspect of what the AC mode does. AC mode um, averages out the signal so that when you average this over several cycles, uh, it'll average out to zero. It doesn't always mean that the signal is centered. Uh, it, I think it's gonna be more drastic with the, the register signal. It, you know, it's clearly not centered. Uh, if uh, this is centered, it should come down a little bit, but it's uh, positioned in such a way that the positive portion and the negative portion will cancel out. So that's a, one of the things that AC mode does, and it can be useful in removing a large DC offset. But AC mode has a certain distortions that it introduces that you need to be aware of. And, um, and this simulation doesn't display that, so I'll do that later on with a real oscilloscope where I can show the actual distortion. So let me put this, so um, I, I prefer using the DC mode. Uh, my rule is that you should always use the DC mode unless you know a specific reason why you should be using the AC mode. And you know things like, oh, I'm looking at an AC signal. That's not a reason to use AC mode. You should have a very specific reason to use AC mode whenever you are using it because it comes with a certain downsides. So um, one of the things I can do with this 
that I was trying out earlier is I can try to show the voltage change across both the diode and the resistor at the same time, and maybe try to show that it adds up to the sinusoidal wave. Um, and to do that, I'm working under a limitation that I only have two channels. And I'm using one of the channels to display the, the input signal. And I, I guess I'll have to give that up, you know, no more display the input. But the thing is, if I do that, then um, my trigger goes away because I'm triggering off of channel one. And it's not really a, I guess I, I could still do it this way. Um, yeah, trigger off of, uh, uh, yeah, so that channel two, channel one. Um, yeah, let me do it this way. I, I guess that's, that's fine. Uh, it's not the best practice, but you know, I, I think it's good enough. Um, the, the best practice would be to get a signal from trig, put it to trig in and trigger from the external trigger. But, uh, but you know, what? I think what we are doing here, it seems to work fine. So let me just leave it here. Um, yeah, so this is what it's showing. And yeah, the channel two is in, channel two invert, inverting channel two. Um, shows you something that's uh, easier to make sense of. You can almost see it here. Um, you know, these two added together looks kind of sinusoidal. You know, this is channel two. That's just the voltage drop across the register. This is channel one. That's the voltage drop across the diode, even showing that little voltage drop in the positive portion. And um, if you want to confirm that they add up the sine wave, well, you can add. It'll give you the sine wave. And if I had a third channel, I could compare this to an input, but, oh, why does it let me do that? It <laughs> shouldn't have let me do that. That's a unphysical connection. <laughs> but anyways, so, um, so yeah, this is one, one of the experiments. Let me quickly demonstrate the other two experiments. I think I'm gonna have you do more detailed exploration of the other experiments on your own in the timed, um, not timed, <laughs> in the time dependent circuit lab activity. But I wanted to just to illustrate some, some of the things. Um, so, so this is a, a register capacitor circuit or an RC circuit. And it, this is a, a portion of chapter 10 we kind of skipped over. We are going to come to it come to it next week, so we'll cover this info next week. So with that, let me just uh, give you a little bit of a taste of what's coming up next week. Let me. Um, so there's a lecture video where I am demonstrating an RC circuit with an oscilloscope in the you know real class, <laughs> and I, the video mostly captures the whiteboard where I have uh, projected a camera capture of the oscilloscope. Uh, let me just uh, reproduce that here in the simulation form, and uh, you know so so you can. So main value of simulation is that. You can make changes to it. You can try out what if scenarios of your own. So, so let me do that. I'm gonna first get to showing the signal. Um, yeah, make sure. I think I want to put it somewhere here. Um, this time, I'm just gonna trigger off of the trick signal here into external trigger. So, yeah, see, it's all I did here. <laughs> um, didn't even have to mess with the level. Okay, so that's the ground. Let me put it to DC, put in a signal here. And for this part, I want square wave because uh, what I'm showing is uh, time dependent behavior. So square wave is good for that when the settings are set up right because it'll basically show me, um, show how you, show me applying um, uh, basically a constant voltage for a fixed period of time. So I can show you what is the behavior of the circuit at t equals zero. And if I set up the period right, I can show you the behavior of the circuit after a long time after the circuit has been closed. So, uh, so I'll adjust the period more finely after I connected the every circuit and everything. So I'm displaying the square wave. Let me... Um, 
put the signal into this RC circuit. So I have a capacitor and register in series, and I'm applying this, um, I guess, minus four to plus four volts signal into this circuit. And the thing I can look at are the voltage drop across the capacitor and the voltage drop across the register. And those things show, they connect to different aspects of the circuit. I think a voltage drop, drop across the capacitor is good to see. It uh, shows you, it shows, shows you the amount of charge that's stored on the capacitor through the definition of capacitance. So it's on channel two. Let me just try to set up the channel two. Oh, I need to show both. Um, yeah, position channel two that's grounded. Okay. All right, so right now it's just showing me a copy of channel one. So that tells me my, um, my frequency is too low. It needs to be faster. Uh, okay, it's getting better. So this is channel one, a sharp square wave. And in channel two, now you start to see it a little bit rounded. Um, so I can continue to change the frequency uh, let me actually do that with a capacitance change. I have two options, you know, 100 nanofarad or 1000 nanofarad. Let me try using 1000 nanofarad. Okay, that um, makes sense. So that's channel one, channel two, or both of them. Now I'm starting to see something that, um, that seems, I don't know, reasonable, makes sense to me. And I guess uh, one thing I can do to make this more perfectly match some of the lab or kind of uh, or homework question scenarios is to make the square wave so that it goes from zero to some positive volts. Right now it goes from minus four to plus four. Let me make it go to zero to eight. I can do that with the offset here. So I'm gonna introduce a little bit of an offset to the signal and let me, so I can, yeah, so I can do this. I can expand the, the scale. Or one of the things I can do is I can actually um, change the position of the, uh, of the trace. So I can make the zero volt to be not in the middle, but let's say two divisions below the middle. So it's, um, so let me, so, you know, test with the ground. Yeah, so this is my zero volt now. And I'm gonna make sure that's the same deal with the channel two. Uh, oops. Yeah, when I use mouse scroll, it moves a little bit too quickly. Okay, so that's how it looks. So remember, this is my zero volt. And <laughs> I guess appearance wise, it looks exactly the same as where we started. But the underlying picture is different because this is actually zero volt. I'm not just saying this. Um, so this is what it's showing. Uh, this portion of the curve is showing the capacitor charging. And this portion of the curve is showing capacitor discharging. So um, let me see if I can, can I make this? Oh, I think I want this to be, Hmm. Let me do it this way. I'm going to change the knob there. And then, yeah, I wanted the period to be larger by maybe about a factor of two. Okay, so I think this is reasonable. So let me just uh, move the position a little bit here. So so let let me call this T equals zero. So at T equals zero, voltage turns on. I'm applying a positive volt voltage across the whole thing and capacitor starts out at zero volt. And over time, as current flows in, it charges up, it asymptotically reaches this value here. So if I wait long enough, the current flowing through the circuit becomes zero, voltage drop across the register is zero, all of the applied voltage goes to the capacitor. So that's capacitor charging. And so, and this portion shows capacitor discharging. Let me call this T equals zero now. And at this T equals zero, I have a charged capacitor and I just connect it to circuit without any battery, just with a wire. The charge on the capacitor starts to discharge through the register. And so, 
So at t equals zero, I still have the amount of charge I started out with. So I have that amount of voltage. And as the capacitor discharges, the, the voltage on the capacitor decreases, decreases until it discharges completely reaching zero volt. So, um, so this is one of the ways you can use the uh, function generator and oscilloscope to demonstrate a time dependent circuit, these transient behaviors. Um, and you can uh, confirm this uh, picture uh, by measuring the voltage across the register. And there's a meaning you can assign to that. Let me see here. Um, so right now I'm not, um, so my channel one is just a ground now. I'm just gonna connect this uh, voltage drop across the register here. And um, as I was talking about earlier, the polarity of this connection is reversed, so I need to use invert setting to, oops, um, <laughs> uh, how do I do this? Um, so I need to put this into channel one, <laughs> and I need to put this into channel two so that I can invert to channel two and do this. Okay, I think that makes sense. <laughs> um, so I guess there are really two ways you can look at it. One way you can look at it is, this can be looked at as a demonstration of Kirchhoff's rules, the loop rule, which says the voltage change around the loop adds up to zero. So if you add these, then yeah, they add up to the square wave that you are, um, that I was putting in. That's one way to use it, but you know that doesn't tell you anything you didn't know before. What I, the way I prefer to look at this is measuring two different aspects of the circuit. The voltage across the capacitor shown in channel one, that shows you the amount of charge stored on the capacitor. And the voltage drop across the register, it's a proportional to the current. Or you, know, you divide the voltage by voltage drop across the register, divide by resistance, you get current. So on this plot, what I have are plot of the amount of charge on the capacitor and the current that through, uh, flows through the capacitor in some um, scaled unit. So, so this picture kind of confirms what I was saying earlier. At t equals zero, as you charge up the capacitor, that's when you have the most amount of current flowing. And as the capacitor charges up, the current decreases, decreases until the capacitor reaches a steady state where the current through the capacitor is zero. Um, so, and you're done. And uh, when the capacitor is discharging, make this t equals zero again, then at the moment you connect the circuit, um, so you make this zero volt like a wire, the current that's flowing in the uh, sense I'm defining positive and negative, it's a negative current that's fl flowing because it's a current that's flowing out of the capacitor, not into capacitor. So, you know, if I define the clockwise as positive, then uh, now the current is flowing counterclockwise. So that's that negative signal. And as the capacitor discharges, amount of current decreases, decreases until capacitor completely discharges and no more current flows. So this is one and you know there are more things you can do with it um, let me just leave that here uh, the more things you can do with all um, leave that for your uh, lab activity and uh, with the resonant circuit um, um, let me just uh, show you one thing I guess uh, there are different uh, things you, you can demonstrate uh, but I'm kind of looking at my time and I figure I should go into the FAT simulation. So, um, so let me just demonstrate uh, what's called a ringing circuit. Uh, I mean, that's not the, um, it's not even the thing that describes the key aspect of a uh, resonant LRC circuit. It's not, but I, I, th I feel like it's uh, maybe the most, uh, um, kind of clear one picture uh, demonstration of what some aspect of what resonant means. So let me do that and I'll leave the remainder for your uh, lab activity. So I'm gonna get us back to the starting point because every time I switch experiment, it um, gets rid of my good settings. 
So I'm doing the external trigger thing. Uh, let me set level somewhere reasonable uh, position here. And uh, yeah, I think I'm not beginning to remember this now. Uh, you know, it's just such an unusual thing for oscilloscope to be on XY mode. That's not the usual mode. Um, all right, uh, I want this to be actually on square wave again, even though with the resonant circuit, it's more common to work with a, a sinusoidal wave. Because the thing I want to demonstrate comes in square form. Um, all right, that's probably good. Um, and let's see, so I, this is my input signal or rather it's now my input signal. It's the input voltage into this, uh, series arrangement of circuit elements, inductor, capacitor, and resistor. And, and uh, because I only have two channel oscilloscope, I only have one more thing I can measure. Um, one of the things I can measure is the current through the circuit. And that's most easily measured with the voltage change across the resistor. So let me do that. Um, yeah. and. Uh, so let me do dual, and I need to set up the channel two. Um, DC, okay. Yeah, I guess um, that's kind of showing it. Um, let me zoom in on the time a little bit. Um, see here, I guess I can do that. Yeah, so, so what this is showing is uh, phenomenon that we call ringing, as in I apply a sudden change to the circuit and the response of the circuit is to ring, it oscillates, you know, it's like, a, it, it, you know, if you, if you struck a ring and <laughs> recorded a sound, that this is what it's a sound waveform would look like, like a sinusoidal thing that damps out over time. And the LRC circuit, it's an oscillating circuit. It, um, there's a lot of <laughs> mechanical analogs you can draw. So it's showing that ringing. And uh, this ringing shows uh, when you measure other quantities too. So I can measure the amount of charge stored on the capacitor. So let me do that. Uh, so when I do that here, it, okay, I need to change my scale. Um, yeah. So this is what it's showing. The amount of charge on the capacitor, it rings. <laughs> As in, uh, let me bring both of these down by about one division. Uh, so, so when uh, I uh, first apply uh, this positive impulse, then eventually the, the amount of charge on the capacitor is going to settle at an amount that corresponds to that uh, full voltage being applied. That's the average. But as this voltage changes, uh, initially it overshoots, and then it comes down, and then it overshoots, and this, so it rings. And this is, um, oscillatory behavior is the interaction between the inductor and the capacitor. And um, on the other side, let me see if I can move this enough. No, not enough. Um, oh, oh, I guess what I can do is I can trigger on the other edge. So if I trigger here, yeah. So on the other side, where the voltage suddenly drops to zero, then it rings again. The Or it's not actually zero. So here it's not zero. I'm pretending that it's zero. But if I made this the actual zero, it would do the same thing. So um, so so let me do that. I, so that's my zero. Let me just add in of an offset so that, um, so that that's a, where it'll settle down to. Um, yeah. So, um, so when the voltage goes from positive to zero, the capacitor is eventually going to discharge completely to zero volt. But um, initially it overshoots, as in there's a moment when the capacitor is negatively charged and then overshoots again and then back and forth. That's the ringing phenomena. And um, you know, I wish you could see this with the real circuits, but what this oscilloscope simulator is showing is it's pretty realistic. So if, if you built a circuit consisting of inductors, capacitors, and resistors, and applied this exactly square wave signal, that is exactly what you would see. Um, so.
Yeah, I guess the thing about simulation that's uh, most uh, unsatisfactory is um, uh, you have to rely on someone's word if uh, simulator simulation is behaving the way it's supposed to. Because, um, you know, real world, unless we live in matrix, you know, it's it's the real world. <laughs> Whatever happens in real world is the real thing. <laughs> but with the simulations, there are always the things that you know, that, that, that are just the bugs, you know, things that happen that are not supposed to happen. Whereas with the real experiment, you know, if it's not something that's supposed to happen, then there's some, there's a possibility of explanation other than someone, a programmer made a mistake. And with the simulation, um, you kind of have to rely on me to tell you that this simulation is behaving the way it's supposed to. It's not, uh, you know, it's not displaying a program error, so. So anyways, this is the oscilloscope simulation. Uh, it is a little bit buggy. I'm um, glad that it didn't bug out this time, but as you play with it, maybe push some parameters to the edge, sometimes it might freeze up. In if that happens, you know, restart. <laughs> so, uh, so with the caveat, we'll make use of this uh, for your time-dependent circuit lab activity.